This is not just a story of combat medicine. I immediately asked about casualties because that's my job. This is men and women, thousands of miles from home. Excited, slightly apprehensive. Scared to death. Cut off by air. The whole experience of being under fire is absolutely terrifying. Cut off by sea. It was bleak, it was bleak as hell. Operating under fire, they treated friend and foe alike. Mi respeto y mi agradecimiento hacia los médicos que salvaron mi vida. We treated them how we would have liked to have been treated if the boot was on the other foot. Dealing with over 1,000 high trauma patients in just six weeks. We were in an overwhelmed situation. Using original footage and personal photographs, testimony from patients, medics, and key players on both sides. Teníamos tres minutos de, de, de ataque y otros tres minutos para escapar rasante. And I thought, my God, if only I had allowed them to paint red crosses on the roof. Theirs is a story that has waited 30 years to be told. I had broken down and wept. This is the story of the Falklands combat medics. On April the 2nd, 1982, Argentina's military junta, headed by General Galtieri, ordered the occupation of the Falkland Islands after 150 years of uninterrupted British rule. Facing overwhelming numbers, the British garrison surrendered, but not before sending a message over 8,000 miles to London. As military switchboards lit up across the UK, the fleet headquarters at Northwood went to full action stations. Within the hour, the message went out to the UK main battle group on exercise in the Mediterranean. Stand to on 48 hours notice to go to war. The British military campaign to regain the Falklands had started. Codename, Operation Corporate. Brigadier Julian Thompson was the man ordered to retake the islands for Britain. General Benjamin Menendez was the man ordered to hold the Falklands for Argentina. Galtieri was in a very strong position. He'd put his forces into the Falkland Islands. They're only 300 miles away from mainland Argentina. He outnumbered us in the air. He outnumbered us on the ground. He had a huge army which he could use to reinforce the Falkland Islands with. Como me acuerdo, eso sí que cantamos el himno, todo el grupo que iba en ese momento en un F-28 de Fuerza Aérea. Pero, claro, uno pensaba en la lo que significaba para nuestro país después de 149 años de ocupación británica eh, el hecho de que yo iba a ser el gobernador militar from the outset i was convinced that unless galtieri gave in and i didn't think he would that we'd go to war because it was quite clear that with margaret thatcher as prime minister we were not going to do what i'd seen so often with prime ministers in the past which was uh, folding up and, and giving in. Do you remember what Queen Victoria once said? Failure? The possibilities do not exist. Mrs. Thatcher's reaction was immediate. Just two days after the invasion, a carrier battle group was dispatched for the South Atlantic. As the carrier battle group headed south, a second amphibious task force was assembled to take ground troops to the Falklands. A vital part of this second force were the men and women who were to become the Falkland combat medics. The fact that a force had landed and captured the garrison came as a huge surprise to most of us. In 1982, Surgeon Commander Rick Jolly was in charge of 3 Commando Brigade's medical squadron. My first reaction was that it was an April Fool's uh, business because at four o'clock in the morning on April the 2nd, the phone rang in my bedroom uh, here in my house and the Marine on the switchboard said, I'm sorry, sir, you're required in the headquarters by the commanding officer in half an hour. 
Liz Law was a senior nursing officer at the Royal Naval Hospital, Plymouth. That evening, uh, I was just about to dish up supper. We had a phone call and it was a representative from the Naval Hospital saying, um, could you please pack your bags because you're going to the Falklands. My first question was, have I got time to finish my dinner? <laughs> and my second question was, what shall I pack? The answer was, no, you haven't got time to finish your dinner and could you be in the Naval Hospital within the hour? The P&O cruise liner Canberra was requisitioned by the MOD to take troops and medics south. It was all rather exciting um, to be uh, going somewhere. Surgeon Lieutenant Commander Andrew Yates was one of the first medics aboard. We boarded her and were assigned cabins and uh, there was a huge amount of work going on. And then finally we set sail for unknown destination at that time and uh, we did not know what we were going into. Richard Moody was a senior naval anaesthetist. We sailed that evening to bands and uh, relatives and uh, all the way down the Solent, cars flashing their lights. And then we went off into our great adventure. The medical team found themselves going to war on a five-star P&O liner. It was quite an extraordinary way to go to war, really, in a big cabin, uh, outboard cabin, in a luxury liner. Surgeon Lieutenant Commander Nick Morgan recalls a surreal environment far removed from the realities of war. I can remember cocktails, uh, three-course meals being served by the stewards, liqueurs afterwards. And there was a very unreal sense about this particular uh, process of going to war. Another P&O vessel, the school's educational cruise ship Uganda, was converted into a dedicated hospital ship. On board, Liz Law found herself equally removed from the war. We had a Royal Marine Band on board and they continued to put together uh, concerts to uh, entertain all the staff on the way down to the Falklands. We also had films sent through from the Naval Film School, one of which I do remember because it was Raise the Titanic, which seemed um, rather an odd choice. <laughs> Three weeks and 4,000 miles, steaming on a cruise liner, lulled many of the medics into a false sense of security. Many people didn't believe it was really going to happen. And, uh, and there wasn't a sense of, of um, danger or imminent uh, uh, death and wounding. I don't think we ever really thought it was going to be a war at that stage. We kept saying to one another, well, we're doing all of this, but they'll solve it by diplomatic means. It's not going to, to turn into anything too bad. Surgeon Commander Jolly thought otherwise. We had a young Marine in our squadron called Garcia. He knew the Argentines. And I looked at him and said, well, what do you think? He said, sir, there is no question you're going to have to fight. Above all, they will not negotiate with a woman. What matters is we recover those islands. What matters is that the fleet is on its way. Further south, the carrier battle group was already engaged in a hot war with Harrier raids on the Falklands capital, Port Stanley. Then, a month after the conflict began, the UK submarine HMS Conqueror sank the Argentinian cruiser, the General Belgrano, with the loss of 323 lives. Con la noticia del hundimiento del Belgrano y obviamente fue un golpe muy fuerte y sobre todo porque en el primer momento no se hablaba de sobrevivientes y por el lugar, la, las aguas donde se había producido era más probable una pérdida casi total o total de vidas que lo que después ocurrió gracias a Dios. Argentinian retaliation was swift. British Type 42 destroyer HMS Sheffield was on perimeter air defence duty, protecting the main battle carrier group. She was unaware of the menace about to strike. I was doing maintenance on the diesel generator at the time, and I'd just actually finished. I turned around to uh, put the rags I'd been, I'd been using into a bin, and as I turned towards the starboard side of the ship, I just remember a bang. When I came round, lying on the plates, the machinery space was in flames. Surprisingly enough, I didn't panic. 
I made for the exit point. As I climbed up the vertical ladder, I could see the skin falling off the back of my hands, but uh, I wasn't in any pain. 20 men died in the attack on the Sheffield. Many more were wounded. These were the first British casualties of the war. The first casualties from Sheffield were very severely burned, and so we had to bring in all our skills and professional skills to deal with them as they arrived. It was very hard to realize that these young men were here and suffering these awful injuries because someone had inflicted it upon them on purpose. The intensity of the fires on the Sheffield destroyed her, and after smoldering for four days, she sank. The British fleet struggled to take in the news. The music came on for the World Service, so everyone's ears pricked up, and they announced that the Sheffield had been uh, had been sunk by an Exocet. It went silent, you know, there was people looked at each other, a bit of disbelief, shock, because they got it wrong. I think we were all very quiet because we then realised that it was going to be serious. It took people's breath away, it took them back. And from then on in, it, it, got, it got serious. Everyone then began to realise that we were going to have to work and work hard. The attacks on the Belgrano and the Sheffield changed everything for both sides. There was no turning back after uh, those two incidents. In the coming days, the sense of security on the Canberra evaporated as the medics came under fire themselves. Six weeks had now passed since the Argentinian invasion, and both sides had lost lives. Britain's amphibious task force has joined the embattled carrier group in the cold waters just off the Falklands. I always remember going into these huge seas and I could feel the whole 77,000 tonnes of Canberra shuddering and shaking as she hit these huge waves. Just six weeks after the Argentinian invasion, the decision was made to put the British force ashore. That decision was made in London when they said, you are to land on that day, by which time we were about 48 hours steaming away. The really tense day was, was D-1, which was the approach in daylight, and we were all concerned that the Argentine Air Force would find us and, and sink a lot of ships. The following day was what we called the run-in, and again, we were blessed with decent seas and very, very thick grey mist and clag, we call it, which was absolutely perfect for our circumstances. The plan was to send the ships into San Carlos water and there to establish a bridgehead ashore. Relying on British air superiority, the Canberra would anchor in San Carlos water and serve as a field hospital to the land forces as they began their assault on Stanley. But the amphibious plan had one potential flaw. Falkland Sound might have been mined at its narrowest point, and the task force had no minesweeper. The decision was taken to send one ship through the gap at full speed. That honor fell to HMS Ardent. Ardent's chief engineer, Ken Entignap, was optimistic about the crew surviving if they hit a mine. We would have the explosion up forward, and the momentum of us being at full speed would have taken us to the beach, where we would have... Um, um, grounded ourselves. As the sacrificial lamb, Ardent raced forward at full speed. The ships were limited um, to 80% power, but um, uh, we were able to go 100% that time. Which is exciting for an engineer, you know. <laughs> In the event, Ardent made it through without incident, and the rest of the task force swiftly followed. They were aiming for Fanning Head, the entrance to San Carlos water. For the medics, the war was about to get real. So we went in with this cacophony of our own fire, although we were actually silent and blacked out. You could see the tongues of flame from the guns splitting the night as they bombarded Fanning Head, where the SBS had bumped into some, uh, some Argentinian troops, apparently. As first light broke over San Carlos, the British amphibious landings began. Despite their worst fears, on all four of the target beaches, British troops landed unopposed. Rick Jolly helicoptered to Fanning Head, 
to see if there were any casualties from the firefight earlier in the day. He picked up several wounded Argentinians. Took them back to Canberra, where they were looked after. Simple things like shrapnel wounds. The British Falklands Field Hospital was at last open for business, and its first patients were Argentinian. These were our actual live test cases. And it did work quite well. We got them sorted out, got them resuscitated, gave them some blood. The usual protocol was fulfilled. But the movements of the British amphibious force had not gone unnoticed. Argentinian spotters relayed ship positions to air bases in Argentina, from which attack aircraft headed to the Falklands. This was a journey that was to become familiar to Argentina's pilots. Nosotros despegábamos desde la base de San Julián y ahí poníamos rumbo hacia Malvinas, que son aproximadamente unos 55 o 60 minutos de vuelo. Y era la primera vez que salía y, y, y me encuentro a aproximadamente a 14.000 metros de altura. Los numerales le íbamos diciendo al jefe de escuadrilla que bajara, bajara, hasta que el, el tubo de chorro levantaba este, el mar. Back on the Canberra, en sunny San Carlos water, the medics got the first indication that something was wrong. 10 o'clock, air raid warning red. The hooters are going, people are looking at the other. Then it all went horribly wrong as the, uh, as the air, first air attacks came in. Que bueno, uno en el caso mío lo vi como si hubiera sido una, una película de guerra, o sea, en, en blanco y negro me encontré con ese panorama, aproximadamente unos 12 buques este, de guerra. All hell let loose. Everybody, this is the first sight of an enemy aircraft, and every man and his dog were actually firing at it. Another 20 minutes went by, past, another air raid warning red. Marines being Marines, you're told to keep everything closed, um, batten down, clips on, um, anti flash on, anti flash was off, window was open so we could see what was going on. The Argentine Air Force um, were professional to the very last get-go. Sí que este empecé a, a ver los disparos que me efectuaban desde la fragata y ahí realmente reaccioné y digo bueno yo también tengo que contestarles porque este, no es de un solo lado que hay que tirar. Entonces. In the field hospital on Canberra, the medical team were in considerable danger. The hospital on the ship was pretty exposed, being very high up, just uh, underneath the helicopter deck. Although we got carpets um, up against all these panoramic windows, you're told to keep well away from it. Take cover, take cover, and everybody dived to, to a relatively safe position on the ship. You just heard the guns going off and missiles going past us, and it is just horrible. And you keep your fingers crossed and pray that um, you're going to survive. Teníamos tres minutos del de, de, ataque y otros tres minutos para escapar rasantes. And then it's all over. It's all over. They've gone. Between air attacks, wounded men began to be helicoptered to the field hospital on board Canberra. We started receiving casualties from other ships. These were stabilized. The first few didn't need operating on straight away. As medic in chief, Rick was soon out in a helicopter looking for more casualties. Six miles away, HMS Arden's luck finally ran out. Down in the south, we saw a ship being attacked and a huge pool of smoke. And it was, of course, HMS Arden. By the time Rick arrived, the crew were already evacuating onto another ship. But two decks down, Chief Engineer Ken Entignat was badly hurt and trapped in the burning wreck. We were in thick black smoke. I was trapped um, by something across my back. And, and no matter how hard I tried, um, I couldn't free myself from it. The fire was burning like the fires of hell in her side, and the glare and glow was very powerful, and you could feel it on your cheeks. Somebody was walking through the wreckage of the uh, dining room, and um, he came to me and said, oh, you're right, Chief. I said, no, can you get this off my back? Which he then moved it off 
and together we tried to fight our way to the front end of the ship forward. We got a whiff of fresh air. Now that, I can remember, it was sweet. And I knew then that we were going to get out. Ken and his would-be rescuer had escaped from below decks, but they were still cut off by the fire, with no choice but to hurl themselves into the freezing South Atlantic waters. From his vantage point in the helicopter, Rick surveyed the scene. I saw a young man looking up at us, and he was obviously drowning. Rick volunteered to winch down and rescue both men. I've not got a life jacket. Um, I've not got an immersion suit. Chap came out of the, the cab, dangled on his um, wire, came down, picked up John Dillon. He went up, um, and then a few minutes later, he came down to pick me up. At this point, um, he splashed down in front of me. He just hooked onto the blue um, loop that comes out of the front of the life jacket, and up we went. With both men safely in the helicopter, Rick examined Ken for the first time. He was badly injured, blood pouring from a cut in his head. He had two fingers missing. And the last thing I remember is the surgeon commander saying, get these to Canberra quick. Meanwhile, the air attacks continued. It was clear that the British had not established air superiority. On board Canberra, the field hospital medics felt increasingly vulnerable. People began to look at each other and think, we've been very, very lucky so far. I just wonder how long our luck can hold. And this was, a, uh, this was quite clearly occurring to the command as well. As the day wore on and casualties were still coming into Canberra, I was summoned to see the medical officer in charge and shown a signal which said that due to the intensity of enemy air attacks, it was now considered prudent that Canberra should withdraw from San Carlos water and head out to open sea. Out at sea, away from the front line, the Canberra could no longer serve as an effective field hospital. Rick decided to relocate. Basically, I, Rick Jolly, uh, had an hour and a half to get my medical stores and people off the ship and into a landing craft to go ashore at Ajax Bay. Leaving the clean, warm environment of the Canberra for the cold, dark uncertainty of a hostile shore was a massive upheaval, but the team set to without complaint. Rick briefed us all that we were going ashore. We then got our equipment ready and were told to board one of the landing craft. Climbing down the ladder on the outside of the ship into a landing craft at night. Some people even said that um, the anchors were going up on Canberra as we left the ship's side. We couldn't see anything. Could not see a thing. Down went the ramp, we carried all the stuff up. Stumbling ashore and, of course, um, um, soaking wet feet, carrying all your gear with you. A shingly beach that then led up, not very far, to this huge, low, grimy-coloured building with Wrigley Tin on the roof, quite a big building. And the backdrop was your classic dark moor type moorland boulder runs. It was bleak. It was bleak as hell. I mean, you wouldn't send your mother-in-law there or anything on holiday. When we went inside, we were just astounded. It was a refrigeration plant. A mutton factory, no windows. There was dust everywhere. The metal rails which were used for the hooks for the carcasses of the sheep were still there. The, the location of the field hospital had moved. It wasn't Canberra now. It was Ajax Bay. Great. That's the way it was. The combat medics would have just hours to set up a fully functioning field hospital from scratch. The next few days saw them overcome internal divisions and air attacks as the first desperately wounded casualties started to flow in. It was the first day after the British amphibious landings. The combat medics had been forced to abandon plans to use the Canberra as a field hospital. Under cover of darkness, they slipped ashore. At dawn the next day, the team awoke to find themselves camped out in a deserted refrigeration plant at Ajax Bay on the shores of San Carlos water. 
The large room had no windows and only one door. There was a lot of tidying up to do, and then, of course, there was all the setting up of the medical facility, as well as the sleeping and accommodation areas for all those staff managing the hospital. Royal Marine Jim Giles certainly felt the place lacked home comforts. It was cold. I don't recall there being any heater, heaters in there, uh, so it would be about zero most of the time. Between back-breaking shifts to bring the hospital on stream, everyone was also required to dig their own air raid shelters. We were all at it, trying to dig as deep as we could, and uh, we constructed some very nice bunkers, we thought. Ours had a chimney in it, we found a bit of old drain pipe, because some of us smoked, and others wrote on rocks at the entrance, home sweet home. We tried to make these bunkers as habitable as possible because if we weren't doing any work, we'd sit outside rather than being in this rather large building which was very identifiable to the enemy. Under the Geneva Convention, field hospitals are entitled to paint red crosses on the roof. This puts them off limit to enemy air attack. It's defended by clearly marked red crosses on a white background. It's also declared to Geneva. At one stage, I was asked, could we paint red crosses on the roof of this building? And I said, no, we can't, because it's, it's, it's situated among a logistic area. The hospital was now sited right in the middle of a busy British ammunition supply dump, a perfectly legitimate target for the Argentinians. To paint red crosses on the roof would therefore be a breach of the Geneva Convention. I didn't want to give the Argentines any excuse for breaking the Geneva Convention themselves on the basis of, well, the Brits are doing it, we can. The hospital would have to go unprotected. It, it sounds convoluted, but it's, but it's cricket. <laughs> unprotected from the air, the hospital was now threatened by some internal divisions. The age-old rivalry between Green Beret Marines and Red Beret Paras now sprang up among the medics at Ajax Bay. I noticed that when I introduced the Para Royal Army Medical Corps boss, the, my Marines started hissing. Um, and that, those sentiments were reciprocated when I introduced uh, some of uh, the medical squadron personnel. And um, eventually it got all too much for me and I just, I just let him have it. He cleared lower deck or everyone outside. And he got on his box and laid down the law. We were slightly taken aback when Rick Jolly stood up on a container and said, I'm now in charge. I wish he was. He was the senior naval officer uh, ashore. And we were, we were subordinated under the uh, Marine Surgical Group, which took us aback a little bit. I shouted at them and I said, it was awful to see energy being wasted on this, this tribal nonsense. I'd never seen that side of him before, but he certainly laid down the law that day. Um, it worked. He christened the hospital the Red and Green Life Machine, and that summarised the joint effort between the parachute regiment doctors and the Royal Marine doctors. Indeed, it was a Red Beret parasurgeon who soon earned the respect of all the Green Berets. The parachute regiment had a consultant general surgeon ashore, uh, Colonel Bill McGregor, who was a considerable father figure to the more junior surgeons. He was much older than the rest of us. Very quiet, very methodical, just a, a, a complete guy, really lovely. He was a gruff Scot, didn't really conform to the military model. Um, had very, very little time for authority. Having probably worked 24 hours at a stint, he'd sneak off to his large pack, have a quick draw on a bench and hedges and a slug of Bell's whiskey that he kept in his large pack and then went back for another 12 hour stint. You know, that was the type of guy he was. So a great example to us all, really. This newfound unity came just as Ajax Bay received its first casualties. At first, these casualties were mostly from the ships, which continued to take a hammering in the waters just opposite the hospital. Ajax Bay's first Argentinian casualty was quick to follow. A Skyhawk jet went low over the top of us, and we all went, ooh, 
and we watched as it ran in to attack HMS Intrepid and as it did so a rapier missile fired from the shore went straight up its exhaust pipe. Pilot Tom Lucero ejected at the very last minute but he was in the freezing water and badly hurt. The Royal Marines raced out to get him, dragged him into the boat, got back to Intrepid. They fiddled around with him and they couldn't do much, so um, they brought him to us at Ajax Bay. All right, let's get him away now. Back in Cordoba, Lucero's wife, Marta, had a sixth sense that he was in danger. Yo ese día, eh, cerca del mediodía, no sabía cómo explicárselo a mi mamá, o sea, pero yo me sentía como angustiada, rara. Eh, y bueno, y no me equivoqué porque después este, esa noche no me llamó y bueno, uno. I welcomed him and I said, here you are among friends. You're an injured pilot. You've been hurt doing your duty for your country and we shall look after you. He looked at me and you could see he didn't really believe it. <laughs> Thought I was going to set him up for a little torture, perhaps. Tom Lucero's first thoughts were for his wife. I asked him where his wife lived. He said, Cordoba. I said, I will try and get a message to her that you are alive. Lucero's knee was very badly hurt. It was manipulated back into place by the British surgeons. In Cordoba, Marta received the good news. A los tercer día me avisan de que estaba este prisionero. Y bueno, y ahí era esa incertidumbre, o sea, de qué va a pasar, ¿no? Porque el hecho de estar prisionero, bueno, está vivo, sí, qué lindo, estoy contenta, pero ¿y ahora qué, qué pasa? I challenged him and said that he'd never fly a fast jet again, so he was quite determined, like all pilots, that he would. Él este, hablaba muy bien del médico Jolly, realmente él siempre me acuerdo que sabía decir que gracias a los ingleses él está con vida. After the war, Lucero returned to Argentina and was reunited with his wife. He did fly again, earning his living as a pilot until he died in an air accident in 2010. In 1982, just six days after setting up, the hospital had settled into a routine of sorts. We knew that the Argentinians didn't have a night flying capability, so we tended to work at night if we could do, and what we'd do is stabilize casualties with more minor injuries and uh, leave them till after dark. Uh, obviously, major injuries, we've just had to get on with it. At dusk on the evening of the 27th, Bill McGregor had just started work on an injured Argentinian. On the far side of the hospital, Marine John Thurlow found himself at the front of the dinner queue. Chicken curry and rice, and tinned pineapple and custard. I literally just got my food and uh, was walking back uh, through the building when the air raid warning went off. Air raid warning red, air raid warning red, two miles in closing from the west. As all non-essential personnel left, Bill and his team carried on. I arrived in the, in the ditch just three milliseconds after Marine John Nelson. I knocked all the air out of him. Marine Jim Giles saw the planes from his bunker. I've no idea how fast they were going, but it, it'd be 400 knots plus, I'd think. And so we opened fire. Inside, Marine Thurlow was still heading to his sleeping quarters to eat. As we got back into the area, there was one mighty explosion. Messed in down on this slug, and then we ran up to our big bunker that we'd made. Four bombs had hit Ajax Bay, but Bill McGregor carried on. Bill kind of just leant over the casualty and stopped any dust going in the open wound. We were all, you know, there trying to cover the wounds with our hands as the ceiling was falling down, there was dust everywhere. There were other folks that were legging it outside, but not him, he stayed there and just got on with it. This bombing started off a lot of munitions fires around about us, so there were small explosions going off here, there and everywhere afterwards. We were sat in the bunker and of course there's rounds going off. We didn't know if there was a counter-attack. We didn't, you know, there's lots of confusion. 
And the overriding um, thought for me was the fact that my chicken curry and rice was going cold and that someone had have away me, me pineapple chunks and me custard. And I thought, my God, if only I'd allowed them to paint red crosses on the roof. Uh, I think the decision not to do so was correct, but I felt absolutely horrified when I saw those bombs landing. I immediately got into a boat and went across the other side. The bombing of Ajax Bay killed five and left many Marines wounded. And our mate George had, had, had died as well, George Davison, who was completely unmarked. Uh, it must have been the blast injury that killed him. An amazing individual, full of beans, full of life, in the wrong place, in the wrong time. The blast uh, and the debris and the shrapnel had blown straight back into their trench, injuring a, uh, nearly everybody in there and killing George. The medics immediately started operating on their wounded colleagues. Still in the hospital, Argentinian pilot Lucero saw just how destructive the Argentinian Air Force can be. One of his medical attendants saw him burst into tears as the casualties came in. And First Lieutenant Lucero waved at the, at the medic and, and waved him towards him and gave him his blanket for the casualties who were being put into the trestles. We rather like that. And um, said, no, 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 it's not necessary. Of the four bombs that hit the hospital, only one had detonated. In the roof space above the surgical area and in the living space lay two unexploded bombs. Would the bombs go off as they treated their wounded comrades? Or would the medics be forced to evacuate the hospital just as the land campaign was getting underway? The British force has established a bridgehead on the Falkland Islands around San Carlos water. Forced to abandon the cruise ship Canberra, the medical teams have been operating out of a disused mutton refrigeration plant at Ajax Bay. An Argentinian air raid has killed several of their colleagues and left two unexploded bombs in the hospital roof and living space. Even as they operate on those wounded in the attack, they need to work out whether these bombs still pose a threat. It turned out that the French who'd made this bomb had supplied us with the wiring diagram. And there was an RAF bomb disposal expert called Alan Swan with us who had this map. And I think he was from the RAF with a set of plans and said, here's the deal. It might have a delayed fuse on it, he said, but we don't know because it's a French bomb and the plans are in French. Does anyone speak French? I said, yeah, I've got an O-level in French. I've just been there on holiday. So we sat down with these plans on the bomb, trying to work out what the French word was for time delay fuse. We went through the whole thing and I couldn't find anything that resembled time delay fuse. It wasn't in my O-level syllabus. Just as they work out that the worst case scenario was a 33 hour delay fuse, the hospital was put on notice of a major ground offensive. There was no time to worry about unexploded bombs. I was ordered to go and take Goose Green. So I did as I was bid and I sent down two para to go and capture Goose Green. Goose Green, a small hamlet before the invasion, was heavily defended by a large, well-dug-in Argentinian garrison. To take it would require a full frontal assault. The second parachute battalion, led by the charismatic Colonel H. Jones, began to move forward. A pitched land battle would mean casualties on an altogether different scale, raising the stakes for the medical teams. How would we do? I didn't know for sure the idea of letting down your colleagues, whether they be paratroopers or Marines, was just unthinkable. So I was optimistic, but my heart was in my mouth. <laughs> As the hospital held its breath behind the lines, 
Two Paras medical officer, 24-year-old Captain Stephen Hughes, was facing the biggest challenge of his life. Stephen Hughes would be with the battalion, saving lives in the thick of the action. We moved forward overnight in what we refer to as a battalion snake, which is essentially a line of soldiers moving forward, following the man in front of you. Captain Hughes trusted his men, but he was concerned that the team lacked experience. None of my soldiers had seen a gunshot wound. When the battalion hit an Argentinian patrol, the first wounded were Argentinians. The team made the transformation from peacetime theory to battle experience. I was able to blood them, if you like, with those first two casualties. But the medical team was nearly dealt a fatal blow before the battle proper began. Stephen Hughes stumbled under his heavy pack in the rough ground in the semi-darkness fracturing his fibula and damaging ligaments in his ankle. This injury would normally mean immediate evacuation, but without Stephen, the battalion's medical support would be severely compromised. All I could do was to tighten up my boot as much as I could, so it functioned effectively like a cast. Despite the intense pain, Stephen had to press on. We moved forward along a track which had relatively high sides. When we came under mortar fire, I decided that I didn't like this at all. And uh, in my own mind, I was quite happy to go back to the NHS and work 24-7 um, as long as I could get out of this place. As the battle for Goose Green got underway, Stephen's medical team was needed by casualties at the front line. They pressed forward. A round went over my head sufficiently close that I, I felt the shock wave rattle my helmet. Stephen Hughes and his team had been spotted by an Argentinian sniper. It is numbing. It, it is something you cannot really describe. You're looking into the abyss. As first light broke, the importance of Stephen's work became ever more apparent. We arrived to an area where there were casualties and we started treating casualties. And when you get into your job, it diverts your attention from what's, what's going on around you. Stephen's next challenge was to get the most severely wounded back to Ajax Bay, which was still experiencing the calm before the storm. Everybody was on tent hooks, ready and, and waiting. There wasn't much helicopter activity, but you could see some light helicopters rushing forward with underslung loads of uh, presumably ammunition. These supply helicopters are key to Kazivak, casualty evacuation. We had no dedicated Kazivak helicopters, didn't have enough to say those are Kazivak and nothing else. The way it worked was the scouts usually, but sometimes Sea Kings carried forward ammunition and brought back casualties, so the same helicopter was doing two jobs. Because there were never enough helicopters for all the casualties, Stephen had to make life and death decisions about which casualties needed to be airlifted first. You have to triage or sift sort the casualties into those that need immediate life-saving surgery, uh, those that can wait. If it's just a superficial wound, it can look horrible, but if it's not life-threatening, then that individual doesn't need to go out urgently. So I actually felt that I was doing very constructive work in picking out the individuals in an order of priority that was relatively easy to make. Badly wounded men from Goose Green began to arrive in increasing numbers at Ajax Bay. 
the field hospital was facing its first mass casualty situation. The scene was a helicopter would arrive, the air crewman would beckon us forward, indicating he had uh, a bleeding paratrooper on board. Marines Giles and Thurlow ferried stretcher after stretcher from the helicopters into the hospital. We were probably concerned that if the casualty rate was any higher, that we'd be hard pressed to be able to deal with them, most of this. It was from zero to toppers in a very short space of time. And it was the first, the first sort of time I had thought to myself, well, this is a really worthwhile job because prior to that, as a Marine, you join to, to be in an infantry company. You know, you're, you're there as specialised infantry, so you want to be with the bayonets with your mates, you know. This was the first time we'd received mass casualties, and I can't remember how many we received, but we started working on them. They were triaged, prioritised, and all three tables just carried on working. Normally we stopped if there was an air raid, but we just carried on right the way through. 30 kilometres away at Goose Green, two para had been pinned down for some time. Frustrated by lack of progress, Commanding Officer H. Jones made a personal bid to release the deadlock. I was able to monitor progress because I had a, a liaison officer with the battalion. He was the chap who told me that Sunray is down, Sunray being the radio appointment title for the CO. The radio signal was also picked up at Stephen Hughes' regimental aid post. I'd heard the message, Sunray is down, I the commanding officer is down. I therefore realised if the CO is injured, there are going to be other people injured, so we moved forward. With the CO wounded, Stephen's place was at the front line. When I was there, we started treating casualties, and I said to Company Sergeant Major, where's H? Because I hadn't seen him to treat. And he said the words, he's dead, sir. I'm Captain Ward and Captain Dent. So in one sentence, I'd lost my boss, my very good friend, and another friend. And it was like being hit by a train. And I wanted to break down and just vent anger, grief, frustration. I turned around and I looked at my medics and I knew that I could not afford to break down. I had to be resolute and professional and carry on, otherwise they would have broken down and the regimental aid post would have ceased to function. The fight continued. There were casualties coming in all the time. I went down while the battle was still in limbo, as it were, to see the casualties that had been brought in, though there were more to come. There'd be a young guy lying on the floor. I'd hold his hand and talk to him, tell him his battalion had done well and he was waiting to be operated on. And that was a subduing um, moment. At Ajax Bay, the medics were working hard to deal with a growing number of casualties. On one or two occasions, when there was just a slight lull in the action, I looked around and thought, wow, everyone's busy, everyone's got something to do, there appears to be a sense of purpose in what's going on, and thought, dare we hope that the bloodletting would stop soon. At Goose Green, the regimental aid post was coming under fire. Five miles to the north of us, there was an Argentine spotter on Mount Asmore. So every time helicopters came in, we could expect an artillery barrage within 30 to 60 seconds. If things were bad at the regimental aid post, they were worse on the front line. The Argentinians were using an anti-aircraft gun to devastating effect, pinning down the paras on the forward slope towards Goose Green. An exploding shell had nearly completely severed Sergeant Chopsy Gray's leg. 
the gun caused him to be hit by shrapnel which all but uh, removed his right leg. Chopsy had obviously bled a lot and the guys on the forward slope were talking to him trying to keep him awake. Unfortunately every time somebody moved the Argentines would fire at them again. News came to the regimental aid post that Chopsy needed evacuating. I then had to do something which I found incredibly difficult, which was to ask my Lance Corporal Bill Bentley to take on that role. And I was aware of potentially asking somebody to lose his life. Bill Bentley risked his life under heavy fire. He immediately realised that Chopsy needed urgent medical attention. Bill used his Swiss army knife to complete the amputation. Eventually, Chopsy made it back to the regimental aid post. When he arrived, he was almost like a cadaver and I didn't think there was any way he could have survived. With his life hanging by a thread, Chopsy Gray was evacuated and the battle for Goose Green went on. Fortunately, two para were able to take Goose Green with the aid, I might say, of a timely strike by three GR3 Harriers on an anti-aircraft battery which was being used in the direct fire role at on the battalion. In the heat of the battle, almost no one noticed that 33 hours had elapsed and the unexploded bombs in the hospital roof had not exploded. Maybe luck was on their side as at last the first major land battle of the Falklands campaign was over. As the Paris secured and checked the battlefield, more and more wounded Argentinians were found and sent back to Ajax Bay. Quite a lot of these guys had been uh, lying out on the battlefield undetected because the fighting finished after dusk and they were cold and unhappy and had lost a lot of blood. Orlando Rufino was one of many wounded Argentinians who arrived at Ajax Bay. The paradox of the war is that 24 hours antes había estado tratando de, de matarnos entre argentinos y, y británicos y 24 horas después un médico de ellos estaba luchando para salvarme la vida no podría saber el nombre de quién fue el médico que me que me curó que me hicieron las curaciones me enyesaron el brazo eh, limpiaron mis heridas pero es algo que siempre voy a estar en deuda y agradecido por lo, lo que hicieron eh, esos médicos británicos por mí y por todos los heridos. Just like any British casualty, Rufino was sent on for specialist care to the hospital ship Uganda. Initially, when they first came to us, there was uh, a degree of resentment from some of the British servicemen that uh, the Argentines were being nursed in beds alongside them. However, I think once they started to appreciate that they were just young, frightened young men, the same as they were, I think the uh, atmosphere changed and they shared things like their chocolates uh, and um, even though they didn't share a common language, they managed to communicate. I sent one of the boys out to the hospital ship to see how everything was going and he came back with the tremendous news that everybody who'd reached there alive was still alive. And that was very important for me that afternoon. This is the second day after Goose Green, when um, the medical officer of Two Para came back to see the wounded. I had a notebook with a list of names of most of the casualties, not all of them. I saw him get off the helicopter, but he was very reluctant to speak to me. And I said, Steve, what's up? I said, how many didn't survive? And I said, you mean the wounded? He said, yeah, yeah. I said, no, they're all alive. And I found that very difficult to believe. 
particularly with respect to Chopsy Gray, who had his leg blown off. And he looked at me shrewdly and said, you're not telling me the truth, are you? You're, uh, you're, you're trying to soften the blow for me. I said, Steve, definitely not. I wanted to congratulate you and your boys because you've done such a good job. I suddenly felt exhausted, emotionally drained, I think, um, because until that point I'd been driven by wanting to find out who had survived and who hadn't survived, and then to find out that everybody had survived just left me completely numb. In the days following the battle, the British dead were also brought back to Ajax Bay. My steady men, the, the four hard men, I, I said to them, I, I'm going to ask you to do something that's going to be a very serious drain on your, on your morale and courage. And um, I want you to help me identify the dead. We had a rather unsavory task of uh, of sorting all that out, but uh, uh, in one sense, uh, I suppose it meant that uh, we could at least give these guys a, a decent burial and uh, you know prepare them correctly. We were very, very careful to treat them with as much dignity as we could because that's the last thing you can do for your mates. You know, you have this form to fill in where you you mark on it the the type of injury and then he records the probable cause of death, missile injury, you know, gunshot, blast injury, whatever it is. They were wrapped, placed in a body bag, and Scouse Davis, with his waterproof felt pen, recorded the name on the body bag, which was put to one side, and onto the next stretcher. The one thing I remember, was looking up and seeing two paras RSM who was looking on at what we were doing. And although it was extremely sad, he understood the respect that was being shown to his boys. And afterwards, I remember him saluting Rick, something I've never seen before. After such a difficult day, Rick was careful to look out for his men. The boss um, gave us a, a nippy sweet, which helped. They call it diffusing now, um, and colleague support. Get in a huddle, uh, have a rum, in a coffee, shoot the shit, talk with the boss, get the updates. Whenever I see the boys now, I, I still apologise, and they say, ah, don't be silly, boss. Um, it was an honour. It was the most important thing we'd ever done. What I do remember was the funeral service of the 17 that were killed. That was an extremely poignant service uh, as the bodies were laid in their mass grave. We all went up onto the hillside where one of these big uh, diggers that had been brought ashore had, had scraped out the um, temporary grave and we stood around the grave while they, um, they one by one, they um, put these bodies in body bags side by side into this um, grave. And uh, the last post was sounded and the Padre um, gave a, an address or a prayer. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. And then we went back to um, to work. Very moving. It was a very sad and moving occasion. You have a time to mourn, but it isn't a very long time because you can't dwell on it. You've got to get on with what's the next stage. You owe it to the people who are your responsibility not to sit there in a corner wringing your hands for too long anyway, getting on with it. Thompson was right. 
For the medics, there wasn't time to draw breath. Just around the corner was the biggest British disaster of the war. Just one week after the British landing, the first major battle of the campaign had been fought and won. Goose Green was in British hands once more, but both sides had paid a high price in dead and wounded. In just 48 hours, the medics at Ajax Bay had treated over 100 servicemen from both sides. 70 kilometers away in the Falkland Islands capital, Port Stanley, Argentinian commander General Menendez believed that British losses would make them hesitate before launching another attack. When it finished, Darwin Goose Green, and they had the conscience of what it had cost and of the losses that it had produced, there is a book, I think it was the Battle for the Malvinas, donde dice, ya nadie dentro de las filas inglesas estaba entusiasmado con atacar rápidamente y sin mucha preparación Puerto Argentino. On balance, I think, uh, Goose Green was a good thing because of all the things we learned from it. It demonstrated to the Argentines that we meant business. We also learned a lot of lessons about the Argentines and how they fight. And I decided I would maximize on our strengths, which was our ability to fight at night because we were better trained than they were minimize their strengths, direct fire weapons, ergo, you fight at night. To take Port Stanley, the British had to cover over 70 kilometers of freezing, wet, inhospitable terrain occupied by a well-dug-in enemy. The lack of helicopters meant that the Marines and Paras of 3 Commando Brigade had to walk every step of the way, carrying all their own equipment. After the Battle of Goose Green, the British had a large number of POWs on their hands. The area next to the field hospital became a prisoner of war camp. We captured a young flight lieutenant doctor called Miranda. And uh, he was a very pleasant chap. And he was carrying a, a surgical textbook by an English surgeon, so he spoke good English. And we said, uh, why have you got that? He said, well, I'm studying to be a surgeon. So we said, my dear chap, you want to do some surgery, do you? Right. Well, come with us. Dr. Rick me preguntó si quería trabajar con ellos. O sea, y a mí me pareció bueno este, porque una herida no tiene bandera. O sea, es un ser humano el que está herido. Entonces, es decir, con los otros colegas británicos, es decir, luego de la... En las presentaciones, o sea, trabajamos en conjunto eh, y con muy buena relación. Argentinian POW, Dr. Miranda, went on to become an integral part of the medical team at Ajax Bay, as casualties continued to flow in from the advancing front line. And it was about now that the medics realized they were achieving a remarkable record, as Rick Jolly highlights in a TV interview for television news. Everyone that's come in here alive, despite their horrible wounds, has gone out alive. This record could only be maintained by the hard work and dedication of the medics themselves. I can recollect times when we were under air attack and we were working, you just had to concentrate on what you were doing. Attention to detail is vital when dealing with modern war injuries. It's not just on impact that a bullet threatens life. The great danger in warfare is that you will get tetanus or gangrene if you sew up a wound initially. You no, know, the classic cowboy film where you see a bullet hole going in and someone digs out the bullet and then everything's okay, it doesn't happen with high velocity wounds. It creates a lot more damage to the flesh than is obvious. A huge cavity opens up with a negative pressure vacuum inside it and that sucks in all the rubbish, all, all the dead skin, clothing, whatever. So that has to be completely opened up to remove debris from the wound. And you have to cut back dead muscle until it starts to bleed again. You then don't even sew them up. You just pack them with uh, light dressings and then just let it heal slowly. Cleaning wounds was routine at Ajax Bay, but the extraordinary was always just around the corner. There was one casualty who had got shot across the, uh, the, the neck and he was incredibly lucky anyway because millimetres uh, further back and he wouldn't be with us. Normally with injuries on the neck or above, because it's very vascular, you sew them up and this was done. 
and I had anaesthetized the next patient when there was a call that uh, this chap was having problems breathing. As I rushed over to him, all the lights went out because the generator failed. So I looked down his throat and could see all his tissues had swollen up. I then had to call the surgeon across who, by torchlight, did an emergency tracheostomy and made an airway so this chap could breathe again, thus saving his life. This patient, like so many others, was in fact Argentinian. Humberto Martinez also found himself at Ajax Bay with a bullet hole in his foot. I was half asleep, but it wasn't sufficiently strong the anesthesia. At the moment I came to the quirófan and I saw everyone around me with the mask, I incorporated para gran sorpresa de ellos, porque yo tenía que estar dormido. Y les pido, por favor, que no me corten el pie. Por supuesto, vuelvo a desvanecerme y ahí no me acuerdo más nada. Hasta el otro día que un inglés me despierta y me dice que tenía los dos pies, two left. Yes. Two. No one, two. Yes. I was often asked, and, and certainly afterwards, who would you choose to operate on first, an injured Argentinian or an injured Brit? And the answer to the question is always, who's the most severely injured? And the answer, Argentinian, then he goes first. During the campaign, I treated more Argentinians than I did British. We treated them how we would have liked to have been treated if the boot was on the other foot. Y ahí pude ver esto extraordinario que es la sanidad o el cuerpo de médicos, donde no existe diferencia entre si es eh, inglés o, 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 o argentino o, no no trabajan todos bajo la misma premisa aliviar el dolor este detener la hemorragia eh, a veces determinar eh, quién vive o quién muere as yet another badly injured argentinian hit the operating table Chief Petty Officer Medical Assistant Jethro Young noticed that vital supplies were running short. With the amount of casualties we were having in, um, we were beginning to run out of blood. And right next door to the field hospital was a prisoner of war camp for the Argentinians. So I said, let's go to the Argentine prisoner of war compound and find some volunteers to give blood to help this chap. And... Um, off went the technician. Normal prisoner of war protocol meant that the request for blood had to go through the senior Argentinian officer held prisoner. 18-year-old infantryman Victor Bertoni remembers the incident. Jefe el médico inglés, jefe del hospital, le pide al teniente coronel Piaggi, jefe de los de, de soldados que estaban en Pradera del Ganso, Darwin, de que diera dadores voluntarios de sangre. Eh, el teniente coronel Piaggi en primer momento se niega. I said, what a bastard, get him in here. That really fired me up. A posteriori me llaman de nuevo, pero para el jefe de, de, el jefe de quirófano, no sé si sería el médico a cargo, que me pide donación de sangre. Lo hace en inglés a través del, del, a través del, del barbijo. Por supuesto, yo no entiendo la pregunta. Respondo el no, porque está me, la, la, la pregunta que me pareció que me hacía era si yo te, la, la vista de la sangre o el contacto con la sangre no es cierto, me, me afectaba. He bent down and turned his head to look at the face of the patient lying on the table. And the moment he saw that the Indian origin of so many of the conscript soldiers, he just said, ¿Cuánto? ¿Cuánto? ¿Cuál tipo? Donde yo estaba reducido aislado, el consul me solicita el aporte de unidades de sangre. Creo que, si mal lo recuerdo, dimos 40 unidades de sangre en las cuales la primera que se dio fue la mía. Entonces yo estando con otro compañero que estábamos siempre juntos, decidimos de, de levantar la mano y ofrecernos como, como voluntarios de sangre. ¿no? ¿Sí? Ahí fueron atendidos y salvadas, salvadas muchas vidas argentinas. Entre, entre ellos muchos compañeros míos de mi compañía. As the net closed around Port Stanley from the north, the British sent the newly arrived 5 Brigade to close in from the south. Moving troops forward by ship meant that the Welsh guards were still on board the Sir Galahad when a flight of A-4 Skyhawks spotted her and moved in to attack. 
Neil Wilkinson was deep in the bowels of the Sagawahad as the planes closed in. There was a loud bang and like you could feel like all this air rushing past you. 50 kilometres away, news filtered in. In Ajax Bay, we heard that there was a disaster. Although initial details were sketchy, um, it soon became apparent that most of the casualties were heading our way. In an attack which lasted just seconds, 48 men died and 165 were severely burned. Among them, Neil Wilkinson still trapped several decks down. I don't know if it was flames I saw it, but if you closed your eyes, all you could see was bright orange. I can remember hitting the deck and hearing what I thought was, was ammunition starting to go off. I had magazines in my pouches, so I was struggling to take my webbing off. That's when I noticed then that my hands were sticking to the tank deck. As Neil Wilkinson struggled below decks, frantic rescue efforts were underway outside. I could hear this voice shouting, over here, over here. And how I managed to do it, I don't know, because I managed to swivel myself around on my knees and my, my hands and crawl along following this voice until in the doorway was an outline of somebody and this person was reaching out, pulling people and pushing them up the stairs. I got to the outside, onto the actual deck of the, the cigar lad, and it, the cold air hit me. This was a mass casualty situation. The small field hospital at Ajax Bay was about to face its biggest challenge yet. The first thing I remember was seeing the helicopters waiting to come in and land at Ajax. They were like steps, six, seven of them leading up into heaven. And the Chinook, with its full load of casualties, landed at Ajax Bay. And we were in an overwhelmed situation. We afforded every casualty their own buddy. And if you can imagine guys with skin hanging from their face and arms, shaking with shock, scared and hurting. I remember the smell um, in Ajax Bay uh, in, in the hospital. It was of burnt flesh and you couldn't get away from it. The whole place smelled of burnt flesh. It was full of these white faces with flamazine cream smeared liberally all over them. People with limb burns, with plastic bags covering their burns. Next thing I do remember is waking up in Ajax Bay in the field hospital there. And it was like pitch black and there was like just rows of us lying on these stretchers. The boys instinctively knew what to do and they allocated themselves to the patients who were all over the place in the, the main treatment room area. You'd leave someone in charge of someone who you just put a drip into and they would get the fluids going. You'd go on to the next one, put another drip in. With a blanket wrapped around them, hot mug of tea and a fag. They couldn't hold the cigarette because their hands were stinging so badly, but they would pull and the glowing tip, instead of stinging their cheeks, was the heat was absorbed by our hands. Some bloke came up to me and gave me a Mars bar. So I was munching on this Mars bar while he was holding it. The thing that still sticks in my memory is the lovely moral courage and cheerfulness of these Welsh Guardsmen. They just said, you know, to a man, don't worry about me, look after my mate. The lowest point of my personal experience was that night that the Welsh Guards arrived with us. It was, it was particularly distressing. The cries of pain gradually subsided. Everything improved until eventually everyone was asleep. 
But the challenge posed by the Galahad incident wasn't over yet. With 160 severely burned patients needing life-saving specialist treatment, the medics had to get them to the hospital ship Uganda within hours. I spoke to the brigade and I said, I need every helicopter you can spare during the course of this morning. They said the front line had priority and they were restocking it. Despite this, over the next few hours, helicopter after helicopter turned up at Ajax Bay, offering to take patients to the Uganda. In this way, many lives were saved. In spite of the many killed in action at that incident, uh, many, many lives were also saved. It was the speed with which the burnt casualties could be evacuated to uh, a relative place of safety on board the hospital ship. The nursing staff there were, were excellent. They were brilliant. They were, you know, first class. And they, they, they took me then in, they walked me to the operating theatre because they wanted to start cleaning me up. And as I walked, I can remember walking past this mirror and looking at it. And I, all I could see was this like beach ball on top of my shoulders. Um, I didn't even recognise it as me. And then I started having a cry. And they took me into the theatre and started the process of cleaning up the burns. It was only later that Rick learned of one of the many motivating factors for the helicopter pilots that day. If you went to the Uganda with a load of casualties, while they unloaded you, somebody brought you out a bacon butty and a cup of coffee. So everyone was looking for a reason to pick some casualties up and go to the Uganda. I just roared with laughter and thought, wonderful. Some, some chef on board Uganda had decided that, OK, he didn't have a rifle or a helicopter, but he was going to do something. The Galahad was a personal tragedy for many, but the British command did not let it alter the course of the war. There was no let-up for the medical teams. The final push into Stanley started just two days later. The Galahad incident had threatened to set back the British advance and overwhelm the field hospital. But just two days later, the final battles for the Falklands capital, Port Stanley, were underway. General Menendez had positioned strong defences on the ring of mountains around Stanley. Y mientras tanto, lo que se hizo fue preparar las defensas lo mejor posible, comprobar las armas, comprobar los campos de tiro, que es lo que se llama, uno prueba las armas y prueba cómo funcionan en el terreno, y después esperar. His troops were well dug in, well armed and lay directly in the path of the advancing British. We knew we were outnumbered in, in Stanley already, uh, but, but that didn't over uh, worry me because I thought we could probably sort them out if we did it in the right way. The medics at Ajax Bay were now over 75 kilometres behind the front line. So two satellite dressing stations were set up closer at Teal Inlet and Fitzroy. I'd gone up and seen the doctors there and agreed with them that when the helicopters arrived, that if they looked in the back and they found that some of the casualties could survive another 20 minutes flying, then they should send them back to us at Ajax Bay to always try and keep some space available in Teal Inlet and Fitzroy for the most badly injured. With medical support now in place, and just three and a half weeks after the first British landings, the final push got underway. Phase one was to be by my brigade, third commander brigade, uh, taking Harriet, <coughs> London, and two sisters. This was going to be followed up by five brigade attacking Tumbledown and William. Hubo combates muy encarnizados, con pérdidas muy grandes. Captain von Bertley had left Ajax Bay to be with three powers regimental aid post as they fought for Longdon. It was an advance at night up a hill uh, on two axes against an enemy that was pretty well dug in by then. And Longdon, I was 
liken it to fighting your way up a bowling alley, the sides of which are held by machine gunners. The sky was just completely illuminated by tracer fire both going both ways, by artillery fire, by the illuminated flares, the mortars. It was like the Thames on New Year's Eve. It's been said that the Argentinians did not fight. This was not true. The Argentines, on all objectives, actually fought. Particularly officers, junior officers, and their regular NCOs, who would man machine guns to the last and would be killed manning a machine gun. Fighting at night over a period of 48 hours, the British took stronghold after stronghold. Each mountain posed its challenges, and each produced ever more wounded men. And of course, the battle was not over once you'd taken the objective, because what then happened on all objectives, you were then shelled by the next load of Argentines who were holding positions further back. Despite losses, the British pressed on relentlessly. In the final phase of the battle for Stanley, Robert Ozzy Osborne was with the Scots guards as they tackled Mount Tumbledown. He was scared. But at the time, you're not, because you don't have time to be scared. You're too busy doing your job. The Scots guards took tumble down, and although Ozzy had not been hurt, he had seen terrible things. Some of the boys were involved literally toe to toe with the enemy. Even the company commander took somebody out of the bayonet. The next day, as Ozzy was helping casualties down the mountain, his luck ran out. Five seconds later, we were hit by mortars. The men Ozzy was with were killed outright. I was hit. I wasn't particularly worried about it, so I thought I'd just broke my ankle. In fact, Ozzy had sustained very severe injuries to his left leg and needed emergency evacuation. I was hit at four minutes past 12, and I was in Ajax Bay for quarter past three. I was there when uh, somebody stuck their head through the door and said that they surrendered. After 10 weeks and intense fighting on land and sea, the Falklands conflict was finally over. Gentlemen, I've just heard that the white flag is flying over Stanley. Yay! As Ozzy went under the surgeon's knife at Ajax Bay, British troops streamed into Stanley. I walked into Stanley on the tail of two para, who uh, incidentally had switched off their radios so they wouldn't be told to stop, because we'd been told by them to stop at the race course outside Stanley so as not to get mixed in with the retreating Argentine army. I walked forward and I eventually caught up with the tail of the retreating Argentine army. And it's quite strange to be walking among a load of other chaps from a different army, your enemy. And they looked at me a bit curiously, but they didn't do anything. Two paramedical officer and veteran of Goose Green, Stephen Hughes, was on Wireless Ridge when news came through of the surrender. I had broken down and wept on the top of Wireless Ridge when I heard that they'd surrendered. I wandered off amongst the rocks and it all welled up and then mixture of pride relief a feeling of loss for those that you wish were here with you as word of the capitulation spread around the islands the medics at Ajax Bay were still engaged in a desperate bid to save Ozzy's leg. They managed to stabilise him and send him on. The next thing I remember was actually getting uh, onto the Uganda and going down a steep slope and scrounging the fag off one of the P&O lads on the boat. It was on hospital ship Uganda that Ozzy had the operation that was to change his life. As they were about to give me the anaesthetic, I uh, stopped him from doing so. I just wanted to get hold of my foot for one time. Get hold of it for the last time, that was it. You know, was, you know, had a hold of it. Bye bye, that's it, you know, 
you know, further use to me. It was spur of the moment. Why I did it? Don't know. The end of the fighting had a direct effect on the medical facility at Ajax Bay. When the Argentinians surrendered, that was the end of our role in Operation Corporate. For Ajax Bay, this marked the end of three and a half very intense weeks. This extraordinary facility had been set up in just 24 hours. It had come under enemy air attack and lived with two unexploded bombs. It had dealt with over 1,000 serious injuries, serving wounded from both sides. Now, in just a couple of days, it was dismantled and packed up without a fuss. Senior medical officer Rick Jolly felt the facility had much to be proud of. We had such a wonderful uh, survival track record because everyone that came in alive, despite their horrid wounds, went out alive. We were hugely lucky. No brigade has ever been so well served. Stood as a world record, I think, at the time. I, I can't think of any other operation where so many lives were saved thanks to the efforts of their medics and the expertise of the, of the doctors and the surgeons and, and the medical assistants. All of a sudden, the armed forces saw their medics at work. It wasn't as if we were doing our work in, in a hospital. We did it right in front of them. And they could actually see it happening. And all of a sudden, our stock rose. The Falklands was a game changer. It's never been quite the same since. Once packed up, the medics headed to Stanley to await transport home. Stanley was chaotic. There were Argentinians, there were paratroopers, there were Royal Marines, there were arms, there were vehicles. I imagine that that was a fairly um, standard sort of uh, post-war period. Even though the war had only just ended, both sides felt little personal hostility. I have no animosity, no angst, no bad feelings towards any of the Argentines at all. They were doing what they were told to do. You know, it's the politicians that have uh, got to search their soul for that. Eh, no guardo ningún tipo de rencor hacia nadie. Al contrario, eh, respeto al soldado británico, que en definitiva fuimos camaradas, enfrentados, enemigos circunstanciales, pero cada uno cumpliendo con su deber. A couple of days later, the British troops, including the combat medics, were back on the Canberra and heading north. The three-week journey home was the first opportunity for the combat medics to take stock of their achievements. It was amazing that we managed to treat so many casualties get them back onto Uganda and get them home. And obviously, those repatriate a lot to Argentina as well. Those are the good memories. The not so good memories are the chaos, the, the deaths, the futility of war. But the things I remember most are the comradeship of those people I was there with. I had the very, very best senior rates uh, and junior rates. And I was very proud to be their fleet chief. The overall feeling that I had of the experience was, I was sad that we were needed, uh, but pleased to have been able to do as good a job as we could have uh, under the circumstances. There's only two or three people who made it out of the Uganda that died. The rest of us got back. It was, when you look at uh, the situation and how far away and everything, it was absolutely amazing. I don't think it, it has affected me in any adverse way. On the contrary, I think it's been a positive thing because it's made me appreciate what life is worth um, and to put things in perspective. The medics finally caught sight of home again and were staggered by the reception. We got back on a Sunday morning on July the 11th to be met by a flotilla of small ships 
in the Solent. It was a lovely day. Royalty welcomed uh, us and it was balloons and bunting and everything. It wasn't until we returned that we realised how supportive the general public uh, uh, had been towards the cause uh, and how the country had kind of rallied together and, and shown great support. It was all a bit overwhelming coming back to the the media and the public. I just got on, like the rest of us just seemed to get on with it, you know, quite, tried to get on with it with quite dignity. We went and did what we had to do to the best of our ability and it was, it was the job. It sounds a cliche, but that's what we were there to do. That job was nothing less than maintaining the medic's solemn promise to save life as best they could, no matter what the circumstances. The Falklands combat medics had saved hundreds of lives on both sides. Los heridos eran tratados y muy bien tratados por el personal inglés que debe haber hecho el mismo camino que yo le describí para los heridos argentinos. After the war, this achievement was officially acknowledged in both London and Buenos Aires. In the 1982 South Atlantic Honours List, Dr Jolly was awarded the OBE. He got the old OBE that he calls other bastards' efforts. So, you know, and he means that. You know, it was it was everybody. It was a collective effort. But certainly, you needed something like Doc Jolly, I think, with the with the you know the personality that he had to make things work and make things work as effectively as he did do while we were down there. And and everybody, certainly from the lads' point of view, got on with him great guns. Over ten years later, they they looked at me when I visited Argentina with the Prince of Wales and. Uh, they said, we're going to give you this medal. It's the same as your OBE, and we want you to wear this with our gratitude. To this day, Dr. Jolly is the only serviceman in history to have been honored by both sides in a conflict. As a member of the British Armed Forces, he sought clarification on protocol at the highest level. I had to go to the, Her Majesty the Queen and ask her. I had to write to her and say, what do you want me to do with this? And she said, you are to wear it on all occasions. So I wear it with her permission. For more on the Falklands conflict, including an interview with Dr. Rick Jolly, go to militaryhistory.co.uk slash Falklands. Stay with us next as President Truman takes the decision to use the atomic bomb against Japan in the last days of World War II.